quick note before the episode begins. On this new series of the Arzequi podcast, we are going to be passing the mic over to some of our colleagues from our department so that they can share with you the interesting EU projects that we work on. But don't worry, Tima and I are not going away. We'll be back soon. Enjoy this episode. Welcome to Arzequi, the podcast on all things law and technology. I'm Emily. I'm Max. And this is a Pass the Mic from Tima and Paul where we discuss the EU-funded Horizon 2020 project ProCancer Eye. Before we dive into, into the topic, um, we briefly introduce ourselves. Emily, would, would you like to start? Sure. I'm Emily Johnson. Um, I'm a research associate at the university and I work on mainly EU Horizon 2020 projects in the area of healthcare and law enforcement. And I'm also studying for a PhD in the area of biometrics and legal compliance with the GDPR. Yes, my name is Max koenig I'm also a research associate working on projects all relating to AI and um, medicine and also law enforcement. Um, I'm also st- I'm writing on my PhD at the moment. It's about um, data brokers. So if you are allowed to sell um, personal data. Great. So, Max, would you like to tell us a little bit about the project itself? Yes. As you mentioned before, um, ProCancer is an EU-funded project. It is um, about improving the diagnosis of prostate cancer, which is the second most frequent type of cancer in men and the third most lethal. And there are issues with um, the diagnosis um, of prostate cancer and especially um, knowing whether it is um, a do- indolent cancer or if it's a dangerous cancer. And uh, in the project, we are trying to, to build a medical imaging platform. So basically the scans from the, um, the scans of the cancer and we're trying to train an AI system to diagnose the cancer um, in a way which is better like at the moment. Yeah, so I think to create something which is more effective for clinicians and for patients, right, at the treatment, diagnosis and aftercare stage. Yes, exactly. And so we have around 20 different partners in the project. Would you like to tell us about them? Yes, they are all from different uh, fields. For example, we are the lawyers and ethical experts in the in the project, but of course, there are also um, clinicians, so doctors, medical doctors and um, computer scientists. This raises some, I don't know if I would like to say issues, but sometimes misunderstandings because we all talk other professional languages. And But it's also really interesting to work in interdisciplinary teams. And we are going to talk about this later a little bit more. Yeah, great. Yeah, I think that means sometimes we have to be a little bit more understanding with each other and outline certain terms more specifically. Um, yeah, we'll discuss that later. So when it comes to our role within the project, we provide the legal and ethical guidance, as Max said. Um, We are the leader of what's called Work Package 2. So in the context of um, Horizon 2020 projects, they're normally broken up into something like eight to 12 work packages, which are sections of tasks and um, let's say outputs, which have to be delivered called deliverables. And they're led by different partners and then supported by other partners in the project. So for us, Our role is, one of the main roles is to assess the legal and ethical framework, which applies to the processing of clinical data. We also monitor the signing of agreements and forms such as consent forms. Um, We've also supported and provided a data protection impact assessment, which is often necessary when it comes to particularly high risk processing, uh, which is actually required under Article 35 of the GDPR, which particularly when using new technologies like this, which has been developed. what else we've also... Yes, yeah. um, maybe I can jump in here. We are also working with anonymized data because um, in certain areas, for example, health um, data, um, they, are, they, they were used to be called uh, sensitive data. But could you maybe explain what special categories of personal data are? Yeah, sure. So if I start, so we have standard categories of personal data, which is any data which... Um, relates to an identified or identifiable natural person. So this is outlined in Article 1 of the GDPR and Article 4.1 of the GDPR. Um, And this means that any processing of this kind of data um, results in the application of the GDPR to that processing. But 
if it is not um, identified or identifiable personal data, and instead it's anonymized, so it doesn't relate to a natural person, um, and you can't identify that natural person, then the GDPR doesn't apply. So, um, and this depends on a number of factors when assessing whether data has been anonymized, such as the nature of the processing, the methods used, and one of the big aspects is the reasonable likelihood of the re-identification. So I don't know, Max, if you want to tell us a bit more about why we're using anonymized data in this project. Yes, um, in theory, this all sounds quite straightforward, but in practice, it's, it's kind of hard to know what is anonymized data. There's a lot of discussion about it because um, in computer science, a lot of um, scientists claim that there is no full anonymization. That's why um, there in the GDPR, it says that there um, it talks about reasonable means of re-identification. So, for example, if it takes, um, in theory, 500 years to identify a, a person, this uh, is not reasonable means because of the, um, in the GDPR it mentions the, uh, the time required or the cost of identification. For example, the computing power, if it would need... Um, crazy amounts of, of computing power or the available technology. But at the same time, you have to think of technical developments. So there is a lot of legal un uncertainty. And this is why we as a legal partner really foc focused on this aspect of anonymization together, of course, with the computer scientists. Yeah, that's right. And it's interesting because legal guidance, for example, in the Article 29 Working Party says that um, anonymization has to be irreversible. It's like it's not possible to re-identify the person. Um, but like you said, there's been so much academic evidence which has shown the opposite that actually absolute anonymization doesn't exist, which is, I think, where we've had a lot of discussions where it comes to this whole reasonable means aspect and it comes to balancing the rights and interests of the data subject then with the workability of um, research data because you have this huge mass of research data which can be of value to patients and society more broadly and to clinicians. So we have to find a way to use that in a way where we still protect the data subject. Yes, exactly. We are, of course, um, advocates for a high level of, of data protection. But um, at the same time, we have also have to think about um, other um, good things for society that can be done with data. For example, um, um, the the research in this project. So um, yes, I think under some conditions, we don't have to be too strict with the anonymization. Yes. Yeah, and I think so back to within the context of the Pro Cancer Eye project, um, the decision was made that at the clinical level, um, kind of in-house, they would do the anonymization before bringing the data to the project, which is obviously a little bit complicated when it comes to medical imaging and whether or not a medical image is anonymized. I mean, you can take away um, all of the data that comes with that, whether that's the patient's name and the condition, address and patient number, for example, but we still have this medical image. So this was a question of whether or not it was possible to re-identify a patient just from this, say, an MRI scan or a different type of medical imaging scan. And the assessment was made with ourselves and with the clinical um, partners and the technological partners that it was not, it would not be possible or at least within reasonable means. Yes. Um, and we always knew that there's a, a, a certain degree of un, uncertain, uncertainty when it comes to the anonymization. That's why we, we, we thought of a of a risk-based approach to anonymization. So we said, okay, this data is, um, in our opinion, anonymized, but if it's not, we have to um, find certain measures that the data is not, for example, publicly available, that we have a, a res restricted ac ac um, access to the data. So um, yes, I think there are certain steps that, sh that should be um, taken if you work with anonymized data. Would you like to tell us more about yeah, this? Yeah, so part of that risk-based based approach, and we had a big internal discussion about this, was the fact that there should be testing of the anonymization. So continual testing to maintain anonymization, that it's not, although we understand that it may not be absolute at all times, particularly as technology develops, then it should be tested to see whether the data is indeed anonymized. 
Um, and so aspects of that, so we have the clinicians who do the process of anonymization and we establish that that process needs to be GDPR compliant, but when it's anonymized and we bring it to the project, that's when they can use the images to test the AI technology on the platforms. So we have, um, as part of the data collection at the clinical stage before it's brought to the project, we have um, retrospective data collection. I don't know, Max, if you want to tell us a little bit about what that is and what the process is. Yes, um, the retrospective data is the, the data which was collected prior to the, to the research on this project. Um, and we can say it's old data. Sometimes also it was um, um, collected before the GDPR. So uh, we had to find um, a way to, to work with this data, even though we don't have the, the consent, which the GDPR often um, is often needed um, pursuant to the GDPR. But um, would you maybe like to say something about the legal arguments for, for working with this retrospective data? Yeah, I mean, so it was necessary, obviously, to find a legal basis in the GDPR. And often it's the case, a legal basis that is under Article 6 of the GDPR, and often it's the case in um, clinical matters that you'd opt for consent, the consent of the data subject to the processing of their personal data. But in some cases, that's not always possible. It's not always the best option, which is fine. So we opted for um, the legal basis of legitimate interest, the legitimate interest of the projects, and that it was necessary for the processing. So on top of the legal basis, we also were required to um, have one of the exceptions in Article 9.2 of the GDPR. So as we mentioned earlier, the processing of data relating to health is considered under Article 9.1 of the GDPR to be a special category of personal data. So the, all processing of this type of data is prohibited um, unless one of the exemptions in Article 9.2 can be relied upon. So within the pro-cancer project, we relied on the research exemption in Article 9.2J. That is that the processing is necessary for the research and that we employ the, the required measures in Article 89.1, such as um, encryption, pseudonymization, and all sorts of security measures where required. So the whole legal basis and legal exemption we considered to be um, fine, I guess, within the project. Yes, and we also had to find ethical arguments for not asking the patient again if it's okay for him to use his data for the, re the reasons or the, the objectives of the project. So we were of the opinion that it would be, <laughs> in some cases, even unethical asking the patients because he might be deceased and asking their relatives if we're allowed to um, use this data could cause, for example, emotional distress. And also um, applying all these anonymization techniques and so on, we were of the opinion that the impact on the patient also from an ethical perspective is not so, so great. So we, we found um, s several ethical um, arguments to to um, not ask the patient or, or his family again if it's okay that the data is used. Yeah, and there were also practical aspects of that. So these are using very large data sets from different hospitals. And I think we assessed, along with the clinical partners, that it would be far too much effort and it would actually um, hinder the work on the project to try and gain that consent. And that was on top of, like you said, those um, kind of sensitive issues where it could distress the patient. They may not even be alive or distress their family. So we decided in this case, together with the, um, the consortium leader, that it wasn't necessary to gain the ethical consent to participate. Yes, exactly. And um, so that the AI model is built upon this retrospective data. It's used as, as training data. And in the course of the project, we are um, also collecting new data, the so-called prospective data, which will be mainly used to test our system. So, of course, the systems um, have to be uh, evaluated if they work because we are um, at some point this technology might be used for the diagnosis of a patient. And if it's wrong, the diagnosis, it could have um, heavy consequences, even though we are always saying that a doctor should be involved in the process. But um, of course, this has to be tested and we're working with prospective data. Emily, would you maybe like to talk about what our arguments for using the prospective data or the legal basis is? Yeah, sure. So the, 
The legal basis that we relied upon here was indeed the consent of the data subject. So this was obviously something which is easy, easy to gain because being prospective data collection, something happening in the future, we're in contact with these data subjects and they can consent or not consent. So I think this was quite simple for us when it comes to um, a legal basis. And I think we also hear which is also easier is that we can also rely on um, Article 921 so to get the explicit consent of the data subject so that we can process their health data. Um, what was also interesting, I think as we mentioned earlier, there can sometimes be the, a little bit of confusion when it comes to the use of certain terms. So there was an overlap here when it came to the use of consent to the, process, the data processing and the ethical consent to participate in these clinical studies. Um, and this is something that uh, we've had to perhaps outline quite firmly, particularly as um, the GDPR in Article, I think, 7.2 says that the consent to data processing needs to be firmly distinct from any other kind of consent or anything else. So this is something that, so, I mean, the obvious way is to do have two separate documents, and that's what we've done. And I think it's not too um, practically difficult. Yes, and there were partners for example, from, from medical institutions asking us if, if it's not more practical putting this into one document. And then we had to explain why um, the ethical and the legal consent are, are different things. And yes, um, these are some of the, um, those issues. And for example, there are sometimes um, anonymization and pseudonymization is used um, as the same term or people think it's the, the same thing, but in fact, it's not. Maybe you could say what the, the difference between anonymized data and pseudonymized data is. Absolutely. I mean, so as we discussed earlier, anonymized data is data which does not or cannot relate, well, let's say within reasonable means, as we said, to an identified or identifiable natural person. Pseudonymization, on the other hand, will use a technique in which the data is represented by something else. So um, to put it in... Um, kind of a visual way, we always say that there's, um, with the anonymization, there is no key to unlock this kind of data set to relate it back to the other person. Whereas with the pseudonymization, there's always the key. It just may be held in a different place, meaning that it's just an additional security measure, let's say, for the data subject and for their data. And the primary difference is that with anonymization, the GDPR rules do not apply, whereas with pseudonymization, they do. So it's very important not to convolute these two top, uh, two terms. Um, and this is something that we've kind of tried to firmly drill into our partners, firmly but politely drill into our partners. Um, and I think we're now at a point where we kind of all understand each other there. Yes. And what was also interesting for me it was um, we also had to, as you mentioned in the beginning, uh, we are also responsible for, for drafting contracts and so on. And it was always an uh, interesting and really long um, um, discussion about, for example, the IP rights which are developed. And uh, also some institutions um, don't want to give away their data so, so freely, even though it was maybe um, agreed upon in the beginning. So this is always a, a lot of discussion which takes longer than I originally thought. But in the end, we all like to work together and it works out. But yes, sometimes you have to discuss a lot about those topics, but it's interesting. Yeah. And I think overall, we have a, a really good group of partners and it all working towards a really interesting aim. Yes. And I think the results uh, of this project will, um, <laughs> um, yes, make the, the diagnosis of cancer better. And I think it's a really, really cool project in general. And even though we are the legal partner, um, yes, it's, it's really interesting also from the, from the medical and technical perspective. Thank you very much for listening. This was Emily and Max taking over the Ars Aequi podcast and presenting the Pro Cancer Eye project. Uh, feel free to check out the links below where we have the project's Facebook and LinkedIn. Thank you. Thank you.